Hello, everybody, and welcome to our talk about uh, leadership. We'll be discussing various topics from uh, various points of view and roles. Before we jump into that, uh, I want to mention that uh, we will go first through the questions that we put into the abstract, and after that, we'll have it open for any questions from you, in case you do have any, because we want to have this panel discussion to be most useful for you. And if you don't have enough questions or any, I do have some secret uh, questions for the ladies. All right, so if you've read our abstract and our roles, you probably know what we are doing right now, but you don't know how we got there. And that's uh, what we're going to start talking about, the various journeys which you can take to become a leader. And they are really diverse. So, Rachel, I'm going to pass it on to you to start. All right, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm Rachel Sibley. Um, I work in the automotive department at uh, Red Hat, but starting with my journey, um, I started off actually at Sun Microsystems, um, so you can probably tell my age. <laughs> um, I was an intern there for about mm, a year and a half, kind of hopping around from various teams. Um, after that, I uh, got a regular position as a quality engineer um, in the mid-range servers group um, where I was working on the hardware team I was doing a lot of fun things like um, um, environmental policy testing. So I got to do fun things like take the system and put it in an oven and raise the temperatures and make sure that the system policies were reacting accordingly, um, inject um, power glitch failures and uh, fan falls, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so from there, I ended up becoming uh, a lead uh, for uh, one area within the system policies. And then from there, I moved into an even higher level lead where I kind of led the whole um, system policies um, team for all the different areas. Um, so it, from there, um, Oracle ended up acquiring some microsystems, um, which I wasn't happy about. <laughs> and then um, I ended up following one of my coworkers to Red Hat, and I joined Kernel QE. Uh, I had no, like, zero kernel experience when I joined the team. So I ended up coming in um, in a lower level. Um, but I ended up leading some various initiatives, like, right away. Um, Little Indian enablement in RHEL 7, if you remember that. Um, and then moving into other teams, like, operating system CI, um, where I co-led that team, and then mod a modularity team, upstream first initiative. I just kept saying yes and moving on to different teams and leading them. Um, but always having my roots in kernel QE, where I maintained, I was a test maintainer for various packages. Um, and then I ended up in CKI with Veronica, um, where we ended up um, co-leading together. I was leading on the quality side, uh, Veronica on the de developer side, and I was responsible for onboarding hundreds and hundreds of tests to um, CKI, um, so up for upstream. And now I'm in the automotive department. I've been there the last three years now, almost. Um, and I am the QE technical lead there while we try to achieve functional safety certification. Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is Barbara Holushova. I am the upgrades and conversions rel <laughs> QE manager. Um, I started my role as an individual contributor in various uh, software companies, most of them international ones, as an individual tester, manual tester, trying several roles like several like service manager, other management roles, and at some point I kind of realized that I care about the team, about the professional growth of the team members, and I care about the people aspect of the team members, and I became a manager, and about three years ago, I came to Red Hat, and I'm happy being here. Okay, I'll just round out the introduction. I started in Red Hat as an intern many years ago, and when I came to the full-time job after finishing my studies, I wanted to be a technical person, deeply technical person. I never wanted to do any sorts of things with people and leadership. I did end up in the CKA team, of where Rachel was, so that's where we know each other. And uh, unfortunately, our amazing development lead was moving on to a different role. And he came to me and asked me whether I would take over the role because I have all the necessary knowledge and already know all the people, despite the fact that I never wanted to work with them, actually. 
And I was like, yeah, I don't want this. I still don't want this, but okay, let's try it out, see what happens. And I ended up leading the development part of that team for maybe four years, five, something like that. Uh, we were responsible for like uh, the transformation of the kernel development process in Red Hat from the patch mailing list uh, system to GitLab merge request. And that's, that was something. <laughs> we were also involved with some of the upstream efforts. So it was, I think, a very successful time for all of us. And then about a year and a half ago, year and three months, something like that, uh, I moved on to a slightly larger scope role of the development pipeline architect. So now it's, I do need to have some sort of like technical oversight and help people get unblocked if they don't know how to solve a problem. But it's very much about coordination between different teams and what responsibilities they have. They have very much the ownership of what they are doing. I don't really micromanage anything like that. Uh, it's them being responsible for what they want to do. I'm there more just to like guide the direction if it's needed and, as I mentioned, help them unblock and also deal with some sort of communication from the users, which might be sometimes unhappy and not very polite about that. So I transform that like very rude command to something that's actually actionable for the teams to work on. So that's it for me, and uh, we do have different roles. Rachel's the QE lead, Barbara's manager. I'm here for more of the development lead perspective. So there are some differences between the roles, of course. Like you see that you can become a lead in like different areas. So what are the main differences? So I guess in, as a quality engineer, um, as a lead there, um, mainly defining like best practices around strategy and um, uh, testing um, best practices in that scope. I think like wearing a lot of different hats um, and that kind of like applies to like all of these types of roles, right? Wearing different hats, um, being able to like lead people um, in various roles and being able to um, unblock people. But um, yeah, it's primarily just like the testing scope. Um, finding the strategy there and best practices. Yeah, so I see it very similarly. For me, the tech lead is someone who focuses mainly on the technical expertise and can guide and mentor other team members in, in that area, while for a manager, the focus is rather on the people aspect or on top of the leadership as a, as a, techni as a technical lead is, is the people aspect. Actually, at some point, I had a discussion with the tech lead in my team and he said that he likes that role because he can do all the funny parts like coaching, mentoring, discussing like architectural decisions, design and so on while the manager has to do all the parts like workday staff, uh, career development, performance reviews, hiring, recruiting, budgeting and so on. So it is always up to the person uh, what's the best, what's the best fit. Um, for me, both the tech lead and the manager should be leaders, but the focus, responsibilities, accountability is different. I very much agree with this. I really don't want to be dealing with any sorts of like hiring and like personal problems, but doing the fun part, deciding the architecture, deciding what to do, uh, helping people out as well with the mentoring. That's the part that I particularly very enjoy on the tech lead side. But that was about the differences. What are some common things that the leaders uh, should know? And what are the skills that they should foster, no matter what role they are in? Um, so I guess being a good leader um, requires uh, good organizational skills, uh, good communication. Um, you definitely want to work on your soft skills. That's definitely important. Um, working with a lot of different um, um, personalities and being able to provide that mentoring and um, guiding uh, different different types of people. Um, yeah, uh, just allowing people to grow, not micromanaging people. Um, so having that mentorship, um, you know, conversation, me mentorship like um, um, roles and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, so usually the leader should be authentic. I think each of us should be authentic, but for the leader, it's it's actually more important because in a way he is the role model for, for others. Um, 
I read some quote saying something like, be the leader you wish you had. And I think this says, this says it actually. So it's about trying to be the leader for the person next to me, for each of the team members, focusing also on the kind of cross teams collaboration, not only on some small area, being having kind of personal integrity, ethical behaviors, collaboration skills, and so on. So it's a lot to be a leader, but I believe actually each of us can be the leader. It's just about wanting to get there. You might notice that a lot of these skills are something that's very useful in your personal life as well. It's not something that you only need if you want to become a leader, but things like being able to figure out the right path when you argue with somebody or have different opinions or just general communication skills. It's something that is very useful in a lot of different areas of life. So it's definitely something that we should learn no matter what path we want to take. And even as an individual contributor, like you deal with, for example, reviews or users or your management and need to have some sort of communication skill to be able to figure out these situations if you disagree on something. Now, that was on the common topic. What are some specifics to your role that uh, are very different from the others? So I, I think mainly like from a quality perspective is just, um, you know, we have to define the whole testing strategy like across like the organization that you're leading. Um, having that like those lower level conversations that are, you know, separate from like what a manager would do out of the organization, organizational aspect. Um, you know, what kind of like CI will we use? Um, how and when are we testing? How are we triggering our testing? Um, how should we gather the results? How should we communicate this to um, other, you know, um, other people that are interested in the results? Um, um, yeah, anything related to quality, anything related to testing, there's, there should be a high collaboration with development. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it with quality. Yeah, and maybe I will just continue, summarize. It's always about getting to know whether all the processes around that area, around the domain, getting to, to know all the stakeholders, um, trying to collaborate with them, keep up with the information from outside. This is also about be, being the leader. Yeah, for the development side, Rachel before talked about not micromanaging people and uh, having some sort of respect to all your fellow developers in the team is especially important if you're working on the development part. You are, you just have a slightly different role from people, but you are still part of that team. Uh, you need to respect people's expertise instead of hoping that they will just like bow to everything you said if, if you want to become a leader because you want that kind of like blind following, you're probably in a very bad area. Uh, Barbara also talks about leading by example. That's like crucially important there to like showcase that you're part of that team, that you're not afraid to deal with incidents or some sort of legacy code. Uh, that's like really, really important to build a good relationship where you also gain the respect of your fellow teammates. I think this is especially important if you go on to a new team or a new role where nobody knows you, nobody knows what you can do, and you need to somehow prove yourself and prove your skills. So like dealing with these kinds of incidents, especially that legacy code, this is something that uh, I know from other development leads that they did also when moving to different roles where they just like try to deal with that disgusting spaghetti that just like grow two heads and nobody wanted to that, just deal with it. They were the person that solved those issues and teammates were like, yes, cool, super, great, we want this person. <laughs> and uh, it was very, very helpful for both the team and the team members who don't need to deal with these issues anymore and for the team lead to gain the expertise. So that's something that's really specific more because if you are a manager, you do have some sort of authority but as on, on more on the technical side, it's more about gaining that respect by doing things. And those were like the positive things, but what are some uh, features or uh, personality quirks that are blocking people from becoming a good leader? Um, well, uh, as I mentioned, you have to have good communication skills, good soft skills. So 
um, not working on that aspect and only focusing on the technical aspect is might be something that could prevent somebody from becoming a leader. Um, unwilling to adapt to change. Um, you have to be able to pivot and adapt to change, being able to um, work with a vast number of people, um, not being so like involved in their day-to-day -day work, but letting, having, having, letting others you know, have that opportunity to grow um, by not doing that micromanaging. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think also some people get nervous about taking on a leadership role. They feel like they're not going to be able to um, be a contributor, um, which isn't true. I think, you know, you can, you can still be a contributor if you want to. Um, and there's lots of leadership roles um, where you are uh, definitely doing it, even like half-time um, for part of it. So, um, yeah. Yes, and on top of that, I will mention also a willingness of the leader to delegate and to take the decisions. Uh, this is also very important. The leader is not that person who wants to do everything by, by, by himself or herself because this is part of letting the others learn and grow. So it's good to find some tasks that are easy enough for other team members or a challenge enough for other team members because this is part of being the team, being the team member actually and letting the other team members grow in their career path. Thank you. So we talked already a bit of uh, the assumptions that people have, like you would help people just like bow to everything you said or you won't, might not have time to contribute too much. Uh, what are some like real assumptions that people have about going to the leadership and thinking this is how it will be and it's just like not the case at all? Um, they probably think we're going to be in meetings all day <laughs> and never being able to contribute. Uh, and, and that's definitely not true. Um, I guess it depends on the role, but when I worked with Veronica on CKI, I was a contributor for uh, probably 85% of the time. So that was really cool. Um, moving to automotive, unfortunately, I don't have as much time to contribute, but I think these are the types of conversations you can have with your manager um, to be able to set aside specific time so that you can be a contributor. Um, there are some weeks where like in automotive, I'm contributing maybe 50% of the time. Um, especially when I'm working in like the functional safety aspect um, because I'm working, I'm wearing a lot of different hats like in my role in automotive. So there are some weeks where I am contributing a lot, but there are other weeks where um, maybe I only contributed a couple hours. <laughs> so um, yeah, but you it definitely, you, you will have that opportunity to do it. You just have to kind of make that as part of your career path and have those conversations with your manager. Yeah, definitely. It, it is about the prioritization. If if you are a leader, individual contributor, you will still need to have enough time for some technical contributions to let yourself grow in that area as well. And it is really essential to find some time for you and allow you to grow in that area as well. And maybe I will compare now and make it pretty clear about the difference um, to a manager role. Uh, because I see an individual, individual contributor and manager, these are totally different career paths. So it is okay to be brave, it is perfect to be brave and try another role as any other role, but it's just a different skill set, it's a parallel career path to jump from an individual contributor to a management role and grow there. And it is also perfectly okay to say, okay, this, this is not the best fit for me, and you can jump to any other role. There are some roles like more process related, like project managers, product owners, whatever. Or you can jump back to individual contributor in, in, a, in a technical expertise, but definitely uh, if you are a senior leader, senior individual contributor, and you want to jump to a management role, it's a new career path. I'll just add to what was mentioned before with the delegation. Like, if you delegate some of the like leading tasks, to people who want to grow in your team, you will also have more time for contributions. So it teaches you how to delegate, uh, how to make the task manageable by the people you have on the team. It enables your team members to grow, and who knows, maybe when you move to the next role, they will take over the team. And it will also enable you to maybe do some of those technical contributions. So we talked a bit about like coding versus like having time to do any other technical things. 
versus maybe staying in the meetings. And all the time that's like dedicated to each of these different uh, sorts of, uh, let's say task. Uh, it's also a way to figure out things. Like for example, you if you're working on something with other teams, you do need to go to the meeting with them and figure out who's gonna do what, which team is going to be responsible for which part of, of the work. So the meetings are also like kind of work, even though you don't see the code as an output of that. So it's it's important to tell them, despite a lot of people being like against meetings. Are there any other benefits of like staying in a meeting for maybe a long while? <laughs> Nobody likes meetings. <laughs> Um, no, but sometimes you do have to go to a meeting to like strategize on um, a certain topic to come to like an agreement across many different individuals. That is not always achievable in Slack and conversations can get lost um, or misinterpreted. So if you have a good moderator, if you have a clear purpose, then some, yes, then sometimes you do need to have these meetings. Yes, so it is always like up to the discussion if there is a need, needed the communication in an asynchronous way on Slack or whatever communication channel or if it has to be in person. I personally think there are only very few meetings where all the team members need to be present. So in our team we try to have that meeting delegate idea that it's fine if some of us just go to meetings and they just share the outcomes or some interesting ideas from the meetings and so on. Also, it is good to set up the agenda because that another rule is no agenda, no agenda. So meetings are good, just we should be wise about how many of them we should attend, if we need to be everywhere, who should be there, and for sure it's not like meetings should not be the main part of our job. Okay, thank you for all the valuable insight, ladies. And now we would like to ask if you have any questions for us. Anything you would like to learn, for example, or have anything for specific things that we discussed? Yes. Okay, so for the recording, uh, the question is uh, the tech lead oftentimes how close relationship with the people on the team can evaluate the performance better. Uh, shouldn't that responsibility come to them rather than to the people manager? Um, I would say that uh, the people manager is still responsible for like dealing with promotions, but they very often, I hope always, but also very often, uh, ask the tech lead for the insight for any given person they are working with and uh, ask whether they have the skills or whether there are any issues that uh, the person should first like improve their skills in. So they definitely do get that insight. But I would also say that uh, if it came to the tech lead role to deal with like that personal aspect, it could hinder the relationships in the team. It's better when the manager like talks to different people on the team, including the tech lead, and uh, then kind of collects that information and provides aggregated feedback to the associate, then to like have, have it uh, make a problematic relationship where the associate will be really unhappy with the team lead, like you don't like what I'm doing or whatever. Anything else you would like to add? Yeah, I will say um, almost once a month, I'm getting asked to evaluate people that I'm leading as a tech QE tech lead. Um, managers really want to get that feedback. Um, they want to hear firsthand because I work so closely with them. Um, where managers might not be involved with that, those day-to-day -day tasks or see um, 
see it at that lower level. Um, so those conversations happen all the time, um, and I think it's, it's good to have those conversations, but the nice thing is if there are some sort of um, conflicting personalities or drama going on, I can always just hand that off to the manager. <laughs> This is the nice part, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, but I definitely agree that it is good to have a regular conversation. It doesn't mean to be to be only once a month. Actually, it's good to have that regular conversation and take the inputs because it's a win-win then for the team, for the tech lead, and also for the manager. So, I I believe this happens a lot in the teams around Red Hat for sure. So. Because with that, what you propose, there would come also the accountability. And very often, it's not what the team leads really want to. Yeah, like not wanting to deal with this kind of aspect is exactly the reason why I don't want to become a people manager. <laughs> and I think a lot of tech leads would agree. Like, this is the kind of drama that we don't want. <laughs> All right, anyone else? Yes, Tomáš. Okay, so for the recording question was, uh, is it better to like lead by example or just provide guidance? Is there maybe any evidence or examples for that? It might actually depend on the role. Like if you are very closely a tech lead in a team, then I think it has much better effect to lead by example. But for example, if you are a manager, uh, you can't really lead by example in all cases. You can do it with like personality, skills, communication, some sort of mentoring on the people's side, but you oftentimes don't have the technical expertise to like imp help mentor your uh, team with like, for example, Python skills. So it's maybe harder there. Yeah, I would say in the, in the ideal case, both. <laughs> but it is as, as Veronica said now, yeah. Maybe also what you mentioned, uh, another sign of a good leader is actually to ask for a feedback. So if the person is asking for a feedback, this is one of the signs of a good leader. And just because we are leads, it doesn't mean we can't improve in various things. So that feedback is really important for anyone to grow, no matter what your role is, whether it's in leadership or continuing with just like individual contributor, whatever it is. Feedback is important to help us figure out how to improve. Okay, so the question is how the crisis different, uh, how the crisis handled differently by different roles. I would say it also depends on what the crisis is. For example, if it's more like an outage, then the manager, the best they can do is just like hunt out the people that can solve it, and then it's on the tech leads and their team to actually figure out the crisis and handle it. If it's more on the personal side, for example, somebody on the team has a problem with uh, a person on a different team they are supposed to collaborate with and uh, they just can't figure out and move forward. It's something that the manager is way more equipped to deal with. So it usually gets to the manager and they talk to both their team member that has the issue, maybe to the manager of that person from the other team and try to figure that out from the personal connection. And there are probably other types of crises that I'm not mentioning. So. It really depends on what the origin of the crisis is. Yeah, I mean, you said it best. It really depends on the category of the crisis. So if it's very technical, then obviously the tech lead would be able to handle that and escalate it and unblock people, um, depending what the crisis is. If it's something more people-related, then that's something you can hand off to the manager. Um, sometimes it's something like it's kind of like a gray line, and sometimes both like tech lead and managers kind of work together to kind of solve that problem. Um, so there's definitely some gray areas there as well. Yeah, so both the tech lead and the manager should be leaders with a very good interpersonal skills, communication skills, with good way how to solve con conflicts. Um, so it is very often also 
about the communication and handover between the tech lead and the manager. Sometimes just the technique the lead might not want to solve that situation, does not feel comfortable in that situation, then the manager has to step in and solve it. And might ask the tech lead for some inputs and so on. So it's a lot about the cooperation between the tech lead and the manager and maybe also other team members and managers. Yeah, and I'll maybe just add that if you don't know whether it's better to ask your tech lead or your manager, it doesn't matter. They will communicate between each other if they are not equipped to deal with that specific problem that you have, they'll send you to the manager or even volunteer to handle the communication with the manager if you don't feel comfortable with it. So don't be scared to just raise any sort of issue how and people will help you. <laughs> All right. I can't compare, so. Yeah, oh, for the recording, because I forgot, oh, the question is how the leadership roles in Red Hat compare to other companies. So I'll pass it on to ladies who have a better insight. I've only worked at two companies. <laughs> um, but I would say it's mostly the same. Um, obviously, the line of work that you're doing is different and varying. Um, and obviously the, the role, like, are you leading just a small team? Like back when I worked at Oracle Sun Micro, it was a smaller team. Um, so the leadership responsibilities I had were very different compared to like where I am now in automotive, where it's like the whole QE organization. So, and working in sort of like a startup within Red Hat. So it's very different. <laughs> Yeah, so I worked in about four international companies and I would say it differs a lot. And I can say that I see that Red Hat gives a lot of possibilities and opportunities to grow as a leader. In some other companies and IT companies, software related companies, sometimes the description of the role is just given. You have a list, what you can do, what you can't do. Uh, but I see in Red Hat that uh, there can be an agreement and very, very often people at Red Hat are really, with, with the Red Hat's culture, the, the, the chances and the opportunities are much bigger. All right, we probably have time for one more question. If there's, yes. Okay, so the question was about leading by example and how important it is to have expertise in that area. Um, I would say you should have some expertise for sure, especially if you want to like showcase how to do that thing. Uh, but also what is important is just like knowing where to refer to somebody else's knowledge. So for example, if you are a new team lead for that specific team and you are not too familiar with the area, Listening to other people who have the expertise is also leading by example because you're just like showing respect to the people and uh, valuing their knowledge. And that is also showcasing others that they should be doing that. So like it's a different form of leading by example. Um, so like on the automotive team, I had the QE um, expertise, but I did not have the functional safety expertise. Uh, so that was something I had to like grow and build into, um, learn from others who were coming from the industry and um, uh, adapt to that. So I think you obviously, yeah, I think you should, you know, similar to what Veronica said, you should have some experience. But also if you, you need to have the ability to be able to learn and grow into the areas where you might have some gaps. Yeah, so basically every leader should be, should have the willingness to learn new stuff and this, like, exactly applies when you come to a new team because it happens. You, you come to a new team, you might not have the best expertise there, but uh, each leader, be it the individual contributor leader or the manager, need to want to learn stuff about the team. And if the expertise is not present at that time, then the person needs to know who has the expertise and ask there and just not be afraid of saying, I don't know, I will ask I, and get, get back to you. This is completely fine. Yeah, I'll maybe just add to that that uh, it doesn't apply only when you join a new team, but also uh, 
you're in tech industry. There's new stuff coming up all the time. You're in this industry where you have to be ready to learn and continue getting educated in various areas. So it's, it's really important for leaders to showcase also this skill for others. And with that, we are out of time, but we probably stay around if anybody wants to discuss anything later. Thank you.